San Francisco Fjall Raven shop and I'm really excited to be a guide with them and usually we'd have in-shop uh, demonstrations um, and events but with COVID we're doing it in a different way. So I'm currently in Sweden and yeah it feels synchronistic that this is where I happen to be and showing you spoon carving. My name is Raleigh Klotzek and I am a professional spoon carver. And this is the second video in a series about green wood spoon carving. So in the last video, hopefully you watched it, it was about axing out a spoon blank. This one. Uh, this was yesterday. I filmed it yesterday. Um, so this spoon blank is a day old, but I kept it in shaving so it should be in good shape. So. In case you didn't watch the other one, um, green wood spoon carving or green woodwork in general is working with wood that is still fresh or um, it still has moisture in it, whereas a lot of the wood that you will buy in a hardware store or anywhere else is going to have been dried um, either with just time or kiln dried in like basically a big oven. And part of using green wood is that it's much easier to work with the tools that we're working with because I'm only using hand tools so it's only a straight blade and a hooked blade for the inside of the spoon um, I don't use any sandpaper I don't yeah those are the only tools that I use um, in the axing process I use an axe and a saw um, but it's something that's so great about spoon carving is that you can carry the tools with you and take them everywhere we did a uh, my husband and I did a through hike last year in Turkey and it was important to us to have our saw and two knives and a hook knife and we were able to carve in the evenings and do projects as we went. It was really, it's, it's something I love that you can carry with you. Okay, so what we're going to focus on today is the basics of um, like knife grips and how to carve this into a cooking spoon. So this spoon is about 12 inches long, maybe a little longer. Um, yeah, this one's definitely longer because I made it longer. And it's made out of birch. Um, yeah, I think that's all for now. And then uh, let's get started. It's great bags. <laughs> so yesterday we used this template and I made this out of a old yogurt container or um, like laundry detergent container. They're the thick plastic items is a really great way to reuse them um, because then you can have consistent shape. I'm sure you could apply this to many crafts. Um, so this is something I may not need again. Sometimes when I get to this process, unless I'm really trying to make um, replicas like the same thing over and over um, I don't usually retrace it but um, I might do that to just kind of see later because you can see it's not there's still space around the wood or um, around the template um, but that's great because that means I have room to use the knife so I also have a pencil in case I use that or if I need to mark anything it's um, sometimes it's, especially when learning, somewhere that you can say, okay, I'm going to put a line here and I'm not going to take that line off with the knife. I can work around that, but I'm not going to touch that area. Um, it can help because when you're first carving, it's so easy to just like whittle away the entire piece and then maybe the neck of the spoon will get too weak um, and it'll break. So pencil can be really helpful. Um, then the other two tools, main tools I have, this is a, well, there you go, Mora knife, oh, <laughs> it focuses on my face. This is a Mora knife, it's a 106 blade, it's a wood carving knife, um, it's a Swedish brand, um, I think they're really great. You can use other knives as well, but you're looking for something with a um, steep, 
uh, like the bevel is very steep, the grind is very steep because when you use a pocket knife or a bushcraft knife or something like that, which Mora also makes those, uh, is it's more like a kitchen knife. So the top of the blade looks more like this. And so when it goes into the wood, it gets stuck and it's really rough. Whereas a carving knife is shaped more like this. I hope that makes sense. And then the other piece that I use is a hook knife. I feel like a makeup artist. Um, and this hook knife, you can see it's rounded at the top, is for this part, the bowl of the spoon. And um, you can, there's Mora makes these. These are made by um, a man named Robin Wood in the UK. Uh, it's woodtools.co.uk. Uh, and I think it's one of the best ones for the price. There's many more blacksmiths coming up that are making their own that are amazing. Some of them have very long wait lists, but I think these are great tools to start with and they're some of the ones that I consistently use. So you just need these two tools once you have the spoon blank, which if you don't have an ax or you don't have access to wood or you would rather just start with the carving part, you can order spoon blanks from myself or many others and I'm very happy to send you um, you know the person that might be closest to you for that purpose uh, it's a great way to also learn what your blanks are supposed to look like so maybe you do want to start with axe work but especially right now you may not be able to get to a class and so getting blanks is fantastic way to start carving definitely something I wish I had when I started carving It would be good to take notes on this if this is something that you really want to learn. So the first grip that I want to do is I have the knife, um, my hand is in a fist and the blade is facing away from me and the knife is facing out of my fist and I'm going to take the spoon blank and cross it over my body and anchor it to my leg. Um, it's really good to have points of connection to your body, it creates stability and control. So in this position, I can push my knife down and take off thin bits. I can also take off larger chunks by lifting my shoulder. You can't see my shoulder, but I'm lifting my shoulder and keeping a straight locked arm and punching down. So this is a great way when you're first starting to be able to learn, uh, use, remove, <laughs> great way to remove excess material. So this is good on the back of the handle and it's also good on the back of the bowl blank. There are certain grips for certain parts of the spoon. Usually there are always exceptions um, based on the shape of the spoon or the wood grain. But if you're working with wood grain that is straight, this is great. So with this grip and most grips, you're going to want to put the knife, use the, the blade, the part of the blade that is closest to the handle, you will have the most power versus out here. In this case, your wrist is gonna bend and you're gonna have a lot less power. If you wanna take off fine shavings, the tip, but here I don't have much control. Whereas when I'm at the bottom, I can get these big shavings, which you're aiming for. Uh, similar when you're axing, you're trying to get some uh, large chips off. So, when you learn this, you're gonna to wanna to go through every grip, practice it, do it again. You can also just grab a stick and do all these grips on a stick. That's what I would do in a class. Okay, so I show you that. I don't use this very often, uh, but I'd like to show it to you. Another one, similar for removing lots of material, is there's a notch right here under your kneecap and so you're going to stick the knife, the back of the knife blade, right there under your kneecap. 
And in this case, the knife stays in one position and I'm pulling it into my leg. This is so much of the carving process is about resistance and finding the balance of resistance. So here, I do pull a little bit with my right hand, my dominant hand, but I'm mostly just pulling the spoon blank. And it's a great way to use different muscles. It takes less work on your body to take off material. But again, these are really only quite useful for the back of the handle and the back of the bowl. And this is because you're always going to carve from the high point to the low point. So this is the high point and this is the low point, high point, low point. In this case, high point, low point, high point, low point. Same thing on the side, high, low, high, low. On the other side, same thing. So. That is because if you, um, with the exception of wood or like spoon shape, you will be going against the grain and you're going to feel it. Your knife will get stuck. It will be really hard. Um, yeah, so you're gonna have the smoothest cuts going with the grain and you're also going to have a smooth finish. Back up here. So the next grip is gotta feel awkward. <laughs> it's like this chicken wing effect. So I'm using my chest as a lever and in this case, I have the knife cradled in my hand like this, kind of diagonally. The blade is pointing towards my thumb right now. And my palm is up. This is very important here, palm is up. My palm is also up with the spoon. And this is also for removing um, like bulk of material. And this is, I'm gonna show you right now on the back of the bowl. So you want to use your core here. <sighs> okay, so that's the chicken wing. I'm going to use it again later. I'm gonna show you all of the grips and then carve and talk and see what happens. Okay, another very important grift, one of my main things that I use is breaking the rules of what everyone has always told you is I'm cutting towards myself. So right now, before in the chicken grip, I was like this with the blade pointing towards my thumb. Now I'm gonna rotate and the blade is pointing straight up out and away from me. And here, the blade, I'm cutting the side of the bowl here, or sorry, the side of the handle here. And I'm pulling towards myself, but the blade is always facing, it's at like a 45 degree angle. And I'm not going to point it into me. And whenever I get close, you know, my, I can't go farther. My arm is hitting my body. So it's actually an incredibly safe cut to do. Great for the sides of the handles and other parts as well. I'll show you a little more. Show you from this side. Can you see, I hope. My thumb is pressed up against the blade here. And that gives me, so my hand is pretty high up on the handle and it gives me more control. You wanna be careful though, not to cut the side of your thumb there. So you can bring it down a little bit, but you'll find more control if your thumb is on the blade. You can tuck it back a little bit like this. So it's not, before I was really far up here, but you can also tuck your thumb behind a little bit.
Okay, now I've started doing the next grip, which is actually what I use the most. It's basically just a little bit of a modification on what I was doing that gives you even more control. So in this case, I'm using my opposite hand and I'm holding the blank with my pointer finger, maybe pressing my palm against it, depending on the kind of control I need. But I'm using these three fingers, the bottom three fingers, to push my other hand. So in this case, I don't really need to pull so much with the carving hand. And I can even come down the handle and grip it with my pointer and thumb here and push. So when I have a very long project, I can come down and get a lot of control in my cut. And so I, I use that in multiple places. Can also use that if we carve here, this part of the spoon. I can do this. I'm gonna stand up. And push with my fingers here. Okay, and do it on the other side. In this case, this thumb is out of the way. Unless I were to really chase my knife over, which you wanna be aware of, you wanna try and keep it on this plane as much as you can. Sometimes we get lost. But this is much easier than just pulling into that uh, space. Pushing, I have so much more control. It will also help when you're doing really fine cuts and I can just get tiny little slivers. But we don't need that now. <laughs> okay, what's next? One of the next ones, which is definitely probably one of the most common things you would do if someone handed you a knife and a piece of wood, you might sit down and do like the thumb push is what I call it. And it's where you're carving and you're pushing with your thumb. I'm gonna stand up again. Pushing with my thumb. And here, one of the ways in which I'm taking advantage of my thumb is I'm doing a pivot. Sometimes. <laughs> You'll also note, I'm gonna try and keep my thumb on the back of the handle versus the back of the blade. Sometimes when I'm getting really close and I need to do the tip, it's going to be on the blade. But if I can be on the handle, I'm much less likely to get a blister. Can you see that? So, again, any cut that's pushing away from you, you're going from like the back of the spoon, the back of the bowl, and the back of the handle, or you could be cutting down the side here. Though, in this case, you want to be careful because the tip of my knife is fairly close to my hand here, and almost all cuts that anyone gets while spoon carving or any carving with these is just from the tip of this knife. It can be very sharp, small incision. Okay, thumb push. Now, the one of the last ones is going to be like an um, apple peeler, or um, again, if you're handed a knife and an apple and you don't have a cutting board, a lot of people will do this motion where they're pushing here and they're often pushing into their thumb with an apple so in this case you want to be aware what I might do where I use this cut is usually on the top of the spoon here but you see my thumb is out of the way so even if I'm cutting around I'm going to miss my thumb with the blade Can you see that okay so and even if with this cut I keep my arms attached like close to my body I even keep it here close to my body The anchoring really helps stability. You can also put your elbows on your knees, and that's another way to stay anchored. Something I want you to be aware of. If you're ever carving with your legs apart like this, I want to caution you 
because you have some main veins here that you should be very careful of. So I recommend swinging your legs to the side and going over your body. So I can do the thumb push here. I can do little cuts. I can do apple peeler. I can't do the chest lever or those. Yeah. Okay, so be careful of the inside of your legs. So again, you'll see me. I'll try and mention the names as I do it. And I'm gonna move the camera back so you can see me better. Okay, now, I'm just gonna carve for a bit. This is the chest pull. I don't know that I named it last time or the assisted chest pull because I'm using my opposite hand to push. And I'm cleaning up my surfaces a bit from the ax work. But as you'll notice, I'm still very much working in keeping right angles on my blank. I talked about that a lot in the axing, is that keeping the right angles gives you more flexibility as you go to be creative. Uh, the sooner that you start trying to make something round or into a unique shape before you've gotten most of the material off, um, then you it's really easy to lose the shape or take off too much. So, I want you to play, but I also encourage you to try and keep keep right angles. In a little bit, I'll pull it in closer again, but I want you to see kind of both both positions. Right now, I'm mostly working on the handle. Remember to put it back straight up and down, hold it away from yourself. It can be hard to see when it's down like this in front of you. So when I come in, I leave these flakes here. Here I leave these and then I can come in and straight and break them off push in a bit just not even you know I'm carving I can just break the fibers there with the blade there's often a risk of chasing uh, like chasing a cut and going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and then you end up taking off a lot of material <laughs> it's always often right around the neck and then the spoon breaks handles almost to just kind of a basic shape that I am happy with. See, I mostly move through these pull grips more than anything. If you're finding it really hard to make it symmetrical, get out a pencil and a ruler. Sounds so boring and structured, <laughs> but it will really help you because it's it's hard to trust our eyes. Just like drawing a circle on a piece of paper isn't so easy. It's easy to keep thing make things kind of twisted. You might also find that the wood you're working for twists as you go, as it's drying. That kind of depends on the wood and how it grew. A lot of trees kind of spiral when they grow, searching for the sun. Okay. 
Let me bring the camera closer for the next part. Be the best option for the carving. So right now, I want to start to refine the shape of the bowl. Um, so there's some une uneven surfaces. This part is a little lower than this part because of the way that the face of the spoon was and I didn't take it off when axing, which I could have done. Same here, this bark is here, this part is high. So I want to bring it down so that this is generally the highest point and then it comes down to the lowest point here and then maybe back up again a little bit. And it's also a little different on either side. So I'm gonna make space for that to be easier. So I'm going to use this push here, but I'm going to slightly, uh, I'm pivoting my blade. have to check often that you can see what I'm doing. If you have any questions, please feel free to send me a message or um, leave a comment below, ask a question. Take this down a little more. Okay, so I've Taken that down a bit, I'm gonna come back from the other direction, but first I'm gonna do this side. And I can also come here and push across. I don't want to push in this direction. That will be going against the grain. But I can go across a little bit. Good. There's always a bit of refining to be done. It's not, you know, the more you do and the more you kind of do of the same shape, it's definitely easier, or similar shapes, it's easier to replicate your process. You see, I'm being quite gentle, especially as I get my cuts started for safety and for accuracy. And I'm not like, when I'm close here, I'm not trying to take off too much. So don't, um, don't dig your knife in. Pay attention, like this is really steep, you're not gonna go anywhere. I encourage you to try and take off like the smallest bit that you can and make a thin, long sliver. And then take off a little more and take off a little more. And then you can see how much you need to engage the bevel, the cutting edge of your knife because it seems harder to dial back um, when in the carving part for people. Seems pretty easy to take off too much. Hmm. This one's got a bit of a funny wavy shape. Talking and carving. But who knows, maybe you want that. Maybe you want a wavy shape. Yeah, I kind of like it. It's still very much in a useful shape. Okay. So now I have a bit here at this end. I can come back to this position. And I want to come in, but I want to stop before, like I don't need to get all the way to the cuts. It's kind of a fine dance because if you go too far, then you're just cutting back in the other direction. <laughs> and then you go back and you go back and you flip it back and forth. But these ones, that's fine. They're in the middle. I'm gonna cut that out with the spoon knife anyways. I 
feel like I just contradicted myself. Went too far. Okay. So this I'm going to refine as I go. But I'm gonna start with showing you the spoon bowl part next. Even though I have more to do around, I wanna show you that um, a little early. I'm just gonna take out a little bit of the material. Remember, every time you set down your tools to set them in a secure place, you don't want them falling. It is best to put the sheath on them. because you don't want them hitting hard surfaces. <laughs> okay. So the spoon bowl part, let me do this, uh, is kind of like the apple peeler. So I'm doing this motion and I'm holding it up pretty high. So I even have my pointer finger over the blade and it's here in like the ball of my hand and I'm doing this motion. The biggest risk here is that you're, you pull the blade into your thumb. You want to keep your thumb out of the way. See how it's out of the way, then up here, down here. And I'm going to start in the middle of the bowl and just do little sweeps. See that? And I'm trying to go from one side through to the other. Again, you don't have to go very deep. Take off small flakes, especially to start. You can always get more efficient later, but it can be very frustrating if that's what you're trying to do. So that is that is one way of carving this. I also might take this and stick it into my stomach and I can push with my opposite hand here Kind of like the pull. I wish I knew this when I started because the, the muscle here was really challenging to develop. It's not one you use for many things. So this is one way to remove material. I can go around the other side. So in this case, I'm going across the grain you might have noticed. Now another thing what I primarily use is this position with it in my chest again or sometimes people put it up in their above their chest in their more closer to their shoulder and I can push and pivot and now I'm going with the grain from top to bottom. I feel I can remove more material more efficiently this way this one, because of how you're working with the grain, I'm not going all the way down. So I either flip it around and do it in this direction. Can you see? <laughs> or, and then I can come in and clean it up by going across hard in this position for me to hold it up for the camera. So there's quite a bit of material in here that I don't need. So I'm going to remove a bit of that and then catch you up in a moment.
Okay, so I took out quite a bit of the bowl. Uh, you wanna make sure that you don't go too shallow. So keep pinching with your fingers. You'll get more and more familiar of measuring distance between your fingers here. You know, pinch, pick up something that you can, you can see the distance of, feel what that feels like compare it to the feeling of your spoon. So I know my spoon is thinner than that where my fingers are. Okay, so I wanna refine the shape of the bowl a bit. So I'm gonna come in with this thing, this uh, pull stroke, the controlled one, assisted one. Birch is such a lovely wood to carve. Don't have a whole lot of it there in the Bay Area in California, but I have worked with it in that area before. Okay, now here I'm gonna do a bit of a thumb push across the top. This is quite thick. I'm gonna make that narrower in a minute. So right now, just working around the shape of the bowl. Being careful. <laughs> and you see I'm not really taking off very much. Some of them are very small bits. You'll still, at the very end, you'll do some minor uh, refining. So you don't have to get too lost in getting the right shape. But there's a, there's a good happy place still have a few axe marks in here that you can see. Getting those out. Remember to take your spoon away from you, look at it, get a little perspective. Or whatever project, any project you're working on, it's good to step away, <laughs> gain perspective. I would so much rather be in person with you, but hopefully that'll happen again in the future. Now I hope that you do get in touch, ask questions. It is one of my favorite parts about spoon carving and teaching spoon carving, is seeing other people get lit up by the craft. And there's so many little nuances that it's hard to cover it in a 45 minute or hour long video because some of them you just you don't come across until you start carving. Okay, that's getting pretty close. Doesn't need to be super refined because as I thin make this a little bit thinner it'll be easier to make the shape exactly how I want it. I like that it's kind of like a leaf shape. I think that that's really sweet. This top bit had a, had a soft part in the wood so I need to take that down. Okay, so now technically this would work as a cooking spoon. It's hefty, this would be a really good stirring spoon, um, but I wanna make it a little more refined. So I like to take some material off here, off these shoulders on the back. But I wanna pay attention here is I don't wanna take too much off the neck. It is quite thick that I could make that a little bit thinner here. Um, I'm not gonna worry about that right now, but when I take off material here on the shoulder, you can see that uh, facet now, um, I don't want to keep the same angle and taking off the same amount of material once I get to the neck. So if I'm here at this angle, when I get to the neck, I'm gonna come up more straight so that I'm not 
taking off as much material. Rotate and sweep through. Make sure you check the depth of your bowl that you're not going too thin. Now doing this side is a little bit funny. You can do this or you can flip it, do a thumb push. I know some people that do some tricky backwards carving. I have not really tried it myself. <laughs> so here's what I end up doing for the opposite side. Then I have to come up. Sometimes this is a part that I would draw because getting symmetrical shapes, because I could just make this, um, I could leave it faceted like this, which can be pretty sweet. These aren't very even right now. Um, or I can, you know, kind of try and smooth things out as much as I want with my knife. What I've found when using hand tools is I become more and more fond of seeing the marks that the knife leaves. You can see kind of the, the skill level of a carver often. Though some carvers are extremely talented, but also when it's their work, there's more of a feeling of production and less of creating fine art. So it can be a very simple craft. And then you might see someone else that you think is a better carver, but they might just be taking much more time to really refine everything, which is not always necessary. As much as I love a very beautiful spoon, I think some of the most beautiful spoons are the ones that are used. <laughs> I wanna to talk to you a little more. <laughs> so, starting to get quite dark here. I'm glad that the, the film is not showing that. So, I'm just gonna do a bit more. When you're carving away on the back of the spoon, this, you know, it's rounded. And when you carve with the knife, you're often carving in and kind of doing a sweeping motion. So pay attention to that, that you're not digging in too much and you can just do lighter cuts on top. Uh, the farther back on the blade you cut, the less in it's usually gonna go because the front of the blade is curved Come on, there we go. You know, front of the blade, the front of the blade is curved, so you're more likely to dig into the the wood. You could use that uh, intentionally and make, you know, kind of like a beehive effect with your cutting marks. Something I've done on some of my spoons and scoops and such. Ooh, making scoops is really great. Everybody needs wooden scoops for their tea and coffee and salt and sugar and I actually need some. We don't, <laughs> I need to make some for us. I end up selling all of my things. Okay. Some things I'm paying attention to. Ooh, yeah, see those are different. See, I wanna pay attention to how, you see this thickness here, is it the same on this side as it is on this side? See, those are very different good to move your piece around. Ways to make it symmetrical. It's those little details that really make it shine is paying attention to symmetry. And also if you make a wibbly wobbly fairy spoon, it doesn't have to be a fairy spoon, but you know, let the wood tell you what to do. That's a really great place to start. That's how most of my first spoons, I still have them. They're wild. They're, a lot of them are just a stick with a round piece on the end. Didn't even know there was an art form <laughs> or like a craftsmanship to it. Craftspersonship.
Okay, so I'm making these facets on the back. I like to do that on my spoon. Some of them will be a little bit easier to see when it's dry. And then also what's nice about leaving the knife marks is as the spoon is used and cooked with and it's gotten oils from your hands and from everything you cook, um, it grows and develops this patina that's so beautiful. And those facets uh, pick up like they start to shine. So as I'm kind of, I'm not going to probably totally finish this, but tell you, I'll talk while I keep going and tell you some of my next steps that I would do. So when I get this to 95 or even 99% finished, I will let it dry, which doesn't take very long because it's not a very big piece of material and it has so much open space to dry from. That's is good to know when you're working on something and you need to stop. Put it in a plastic bag, put it in a plastic bag and put it in the fridge depending on what the temperature is of either your house or outside, what time of year. This will keep it from drying out too fast. Um, otherwise, some wood dries so fast while you're carving even but it's still possible to carve it'll just be a little harder so when i'm close to that almost done even done kind of depends on the sharpness of your tools and the wood you're using i'll let it dry once it's dry i'll come back see if there's any changing like slight refining to shape any little uh, flakes of wood I kind of forgot or didn't notice and I might add some like I might put little bevels or chamfers right on the edges of these corners so they're not so sharp which means that I'll just take off here let's see if you can see take off slight little bits and that just makes them, uh, I feel like it actually makes them a little bit sturdier. So I'll do that once it's dry. And because once your wood is dry, you'll get a smoother finish. Um, and again, I mentioned earlier, I don't sand any of my spoons. And some people are like, why not? Why would you not sand something? And, <laughs> uh, I don't sand them because I don't need to. Because when you have sharp tools and good technique, you have a smooth surface. It's not going to be like, like a sanded piece of wood um, where you can't feel anything. Like I can still feel the bevels and such on here, but you will still have a very clean, smooth surface. And the issues with um, when you're sanding something is you're basically like grinding away at the wood and you're taking the fibers and raising them. And so when you sand something out of wood, like a spoon that's going to go in and out of water, you need to sand it and then you need to like soak it in water and let it dry and then sand it with a higher grit and then keep doing this process, uh, process until you get to, um, you know, something that's like silk. But when you're carving, I'm not raising the fibers. And so the spoons are more likely to stay smooth. I hear a lot of people say they don't like eating with wooden spoons because I love making eating spoons and I eat out of wooden bowls and use wooden spoons and they don't like it because they get fuzzy. These don't get fuzzy. <laughs> I use like the same bowl and same spoon every day. And one, I love that I feel like it brings me closer to like I'm more aware of my meal when I'm eating out of you know some eating from something that's handmade it doesn't even have to be wooden I feel that way often when I'm also from a nice handmade ceramic bowl but there's something really special about not eating off a metal spoon okay 
So I'm gonna come through here. I'm gonna check everything. Right now the bark is on. I can't, uh, I can't really recommend doing that. It might pop off. It depends on the time of year it was harvested. Also once with use, it's very much more likely to come off. And so um, I know when I sell them, I don't typically do that or I warn them that it might pop off because they might think something's wrong with their spoon if it comes off. But it can look really sweet. Um, to keep that on and feels like it's a reminder of where it came from. Okay, yeah, so I feel pretty good with this being a strong cooking spoon. I'm gonna do a few things to maybe refine it once it's dry and I have better lighting. <laughs> um, I will also clean up the bowl of the spoon. Right now this is pretty chunky. I might, I'm gonna make this rim an even uh, width and then I'm gonna smooth this out a little bit. And right now, like this is, this is a good cooking spoon and it will scoop a lot. There's a lot, so many little things you can do. So that's how you carve a wooden spoon. Um, I hope I've covered the majority of things that you need. Um, it's so different to put your hands on the tools and the wood itself. And so if you have questions now or you have questions later, again, please reach out. And um, I hope to see you in the store in Fiala Raven in San Francisco um, in the new year when hopefully we can have some gatherings again. I'd really love to see you there. Bye.